Okay, so hello, uh, welcome. Uh, so this is the second lecture. And, um, so uh, today I will talk about functions on forms on Riemann surfaces. Uh, there are more functions on forms. Uh, I started the, uh, last time to give the definition. Uh, well, so first of all, uh, of course I made a mistake, a typo in my uh, previous uh, talk. I, I just wanted to introduce the idea that when you want to integrate a uh, differential form involving algebraic functions, like square root of Four, uh, you can find different behaviors. Either you find things, either these are, for instance, differentials of rational functions, or also they can involve logs. But just what I wanted to show, and of course I choose a wrong example. In fact, I was thinking of k equals 1, and I thought, OK, I will give directly the formula for general powers. But in fact, it was wrong. It's not, uh, last time I wrote x to the power k. In fact, what you should use is the uh, case chef, chef polynomial. Then the, the formula is correct. Uh, so you see that y equals power root of x minus 4 is a genus 0 algebraic curve. And there are two kinds of behavior, either rational or with logs. And that's what we shall call uh, second kind differential or third kind differentials. And on a genus zero curve, there is no first kind. That's why here you have only two types and not three. But usually you have three types of functions. And that's what we are going to see today. Uh, so I recall last time I wrote the definition of a differential form or on the function. Uh, it's something that is defined in each chart u. Uh, in each chart u, you have a function f u of z. Uh, you multiply it by dz to the power k. And if f u uh, transforms, if you go from one, car one chart to another chart by the transition function c, uh, so this is u, this is u prime, on, on the intersection, uh, you use the transition function psi. And uh, if f transforms like f times the derivative of psi to the power k, this is a kth order form, by definition. If k equals 0, this is just called a function. If k equals 1, it's called a one form. If k equals 2, it's called a quadratic form. Uh, be careful. A kth order form is not uh, an order k differential. It's not uh, an exterior product of uh, uh, of differentials is just a differential to a, to a power k. It just means that it transforms with a Jacobian to a power k. Uh, okay, but today we shall be concerned only with k equals 0 and k equals 1. That's all what we shall look at. So functions on force. What are their properties and what uh, can we say about them? So uh, I was mentioning that there was a script last time, but several people have noticed, of course. Uh, so uh, let me continue. So, uh, what can we say about differential uh, about functions on forms? Well, first of all, uh, forms, so integrals of forms, on art, and in short on art. So I will not write the precise definition, but imagine you have your manifold. It's covered by several uh, charts. And you have a Jordan arc. Well, you shall just cut it into pieces. So this is your Jordan arc gamma. And you shall just write 
by definition, if I write that, so if omega is a one form, so which means that omega of z equals omega u, sorry, omega of p, a point in the, it's, it's going to be omega u uh, of uh, phi u of p, uh, d phi u of p, or so, where this is, so, this goes from u, 1, u, 2, and so, and so on, u, 3, and so on. Okay, so this is 5 u. And so the variable here, let's call it z. And on each chart, you have a certain function, 5 u. Another way to write that is that omega 5u minus 1 of z is defined as omega u of z dz. Okay, it's the same deep chart. So in each chart, you use a certain variable z because it's, a, it's an open subset of C. You use the variable z. And if omega u transforms from one chart to the other, like uh, the Jacobian, then this is well defined for the whole manifold. On the whole manifold. And by definition, definition, you shall, shall say that integral of <coughs> gamma of omega is by definition sum over i, integral of gamma i of uh, omega. So which is the same thing as it were from on i of phi u of gamma i omega u of z g z so and it's independent of how you cut Uh, of of uh, choice of charts. Okay, so it's well defined. So it's just the natural idea that you can integrate the one form on a contour, and it does not depend on how you cut your contour into pieces so that each piece lies in a single chart. So this is gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3. Well, this is sorry. This is phi u1 of gamma 1, phi u2 of gamma 2, and phi u3 of gamma 3. So it just means that the integral, is, uh, the integral of a one form is well defined. Uh, okay. Um, another thing that is well defined is uh, the order of vanishing. Um, yes. The order, so uh, definition order of uh, of a fun function so <coughs> so if you take a meromorphic function the order of a point p at a point p of f is the order of vanishing so it's equal to k if uh, in the chart. So if you have a certain chart to which your p belongs and it sends to a u, and assume that you send, um, if, so 
if f of uh, q, sorry, if f u of z behaves like z minus phi u of p to the power k, so if it vanishes to the order k, basically in a certain chart, uh, you call the order k. If it has a pole, uh, if f u of z behaves like c u z to the minus k. So if it has a pole of order, uh, so if, if it has a pole of degree k, then you call the order minus k. And it's zero if f u, sorry, f u has no zero or pole at p. It's independent. So the order to which a function vanishes is independent of which chart you have used to define it. It's kind of obvious. Ah, the pole is not at uh, phi u of p. Sorry? Then the second uh, case. Line. Sorry. Oh, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, then minus phi u of p. minus k. Okay, so the order is well defined. So the notion of degree of poles is well defined. But just notice that the coefficient Cu, which is in front, Cu depends on the chart. It's not, uh, it's not uh, well defined, the coefficient. But there is one case, there is one kind of coefficient that's independent of the chart, and it's the residue. Residue of uh, one form. There is no notion of residue of the function. You can have residue only of differential forms. Um, in fact, it's quite obvious that residues are integrals. It's the Cauchy uh, formula. So uh, if you take one form omega, uh, yes, sorry. You have the same property for forms. Uh, you can define also the order of vanishing of one form or of a k form by the same formula. So here I have written a function. Well, for case order, sorry, uh, not k but uh, n for order form. Residue of one form. So if uh, if omega of uh, phi u minus one of z is we shall define it as omega u of z dz in chart u, then uh, and if it behaves, if omega u of z has as the Laurent polynomial expansion sum from k equals minus, sorry, sorry, order p of omega to uh, infinity, so it can be negative, ck, sorry, it's omega u.
Okay, so you just perform a Laurent series expansion, so that can be, so it's like a Taylor expansion, except that you can start at negative order if, uh, if there is a pole. Okay, then the coefficient Cu minus one is, uh, so when you define residue at P of omega equals Cu minus one, that's the definition, is independent of the choice of chart. And how do you see that? Well, you just use the transition functions to see that if you choose a null chart, you get the same result. And there is the Cauchy theorem. But the residue of omega at a point P is uh, 1 over 2 pi i integral of omega on a certain contour that surrounds p. Well, it's true in every chart. So it's true, uh, and maybe you can check, but this is true uh, independently of the chart. So which means, again, that if you have your manifold, and you have your P somewhere, you can take a small contour. Well, it's exactly the same thing as if you work in an open subset of C. Well, you get exactly the same result. Sorry, uh, why do you write SIM for the Lorana expansion? Uh, Sorry? The Lorentz <coughs> expansion of omega u, you, you wrote a uh, sim. Uh, it's not equal, I mean, uh, it's uh, a okay. series, uh, yeah, yeah, a real it's series it's conversion. Series. So yes, it has a radius. So remember that all our functions are meromorphic, okay. so it means that there is, uh, there is a fine uh, radius of convergence, and this is valid only in a small neighborhood of p. Ah, just because so it yes, is a so small neighbor. So, okay. so it's, it's in a neighborhood when z goes to phi u of p. Okay. It's an asymptotic expansion near value of P. <coughs> so, we have defined the notion of order of a pole, order of a zero, <coughs> uh, residue integrals. So, the idea is that you can integrate different forms. You can integrate different forms, different forms have residues. And now let me just give some examples. So, this is all in chapter of examples. So, on the Riemann sphere, which I call C bar, which is CP1, which is also C with a point at infinity. And it's made of two charts, one chart that is basically C, and one chart that is the vicinity of infinity, which you can obtain by the transition function Z to 1 over Z. Basically, you can use the coordinate 1 over Z in the vicinity of infinity. So the function, the, so let's take F of Z equal Z. It is a meromorphic function. Function on C bar. It has one pole. So basically, you have order uh, at zero of f, which is one. It, sorry, it vanishes at z equals zero to order one. Okay. Z vanishes at Z equals zero. And it has a pole at infinity. So it has a pole, so a pole of degree one, which is uh, something of order minus one. And you can see that by noticing that Z equals, so if you use, uh, 
So basically use psi of z is what I would call z prime. Most of the time it's 1 over z. So z is 1 over z prime, where z prime is the coordinate in the chart near infinity. And you see that it vanishes at z prime equals 0. Uh, sorry, it has a pole of degree 1 at z prime equals 0, meaning that f has a pole of order one of degree 1 at z prime equals 0, which is the same as z equals infinity. Another example is the one form omega of z equals dz, which is minus dz prime over z prime squared. So it's a differential form, it's a neuromorphic one form. It never vanishes. You see that in the chart, in the first chart, the coefficient here is 1, it has no 0. In the second chart, the coefficient here is 1 over z prime square. Uh, it does not vanish. Uh, as, soon, as long as z prime is finite, it never vanishes, so this has no zero. It has no zero. And uh, it has a pole. It has a pole at z prime equals zero. It's a double pole. So it has a double pole. So order at infinity of omega equals minus two. It has a double pole at infinity. It has a double pole at the point z equals infinity, which is the same as z prime equals zero. Okay. Let me take another example on the torus. My torus is C quotient by Z plus tau Z. So, sorry, so the order of uh, quark is an invariant of. Uh, sorry? Of the, is it invariant of the choice? Yes, yes, it is. But how, how do you say that order of omega is minus 2, but you say dz? Yes. Sorry? Or the zero? It's because you have a pole of degree 2 at Z prime equals 0. And that well, z prime is 1 over z, so z prime equals 0 means z equals infinity. Okay. And when you write this z? Uh, okay. What I call the Riemann sphere is really c plus the point at infinity. So z is the variable, uh, is the uniformization variable of the Riemann sphere, so it's the coordinate in the chart c, uh, but it's the wrong coordinate in the vicinity of infinity. And but in the vicinity of infinity, I should use 1 over z as a coordinate. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just so. The Riemann sphere is basically the complex plane. Uh, well, so, so it's, it's the. So it's. So you have this point here, infinity. You have the point 0 there. On most of the Riemann sphere, you can use the coordinate z. But in the vicinity of infinity, you better map this vicinity of infinity to also a disk in the complex plane uh, centered at z prime equals 0. So, so this is the only the, the canonical way to com compute the order of this form. So if you yes. get the identity function, the canonical way yes. to so do this, maybe two. you did not arrive at the beginning, but uh, that's what I explained. But uh, to compute the order of a pole or of a zero, you choose a chart, and this order is independent of the chart. Uh, yes, the order is independent of the chart that you use. You just need to make sure that you use a chart that is appropriate, a coordinate that is appropriate in your in your form. Uh, so now take the torus, so which is you take the parallelogram one tau, and you identify a point z as 
z is the same point as z plus 1, the same point as z plus tau. So which means that you uh, glue this to this and glue this to this. Okay. And stores. And let's construct a function. And let me call that p of z equals 1 over z squared plus sum over n m belong to z square minus uh, the point zero zero of one over z minus n minus tau m to the square but this sum would be not convergent so let me remove n plus tau m to the square so now this is absolutely convergent and this is called the Weyer truss function. It is a well-defined meromorphic function because it satisfies the transition <coughs> condition that so p of z is p of z plus 1 is p of z plus 2 uh, plus tau. So it's a well-defined meromorphic function. And it has a pole of order 2 uh, of degree 2, so order of this function at the point 0 is minus 2. It has a double pole at z equals 0, that's obvious. So it has a double pole at this point. And mini, uh, at this point, I mean, and all the images by one. Uh, so it means it has a pole there. It has also a pole there, 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 on all, on all the lattice. But all those points are the same point on the torus. So it has only, so on the torus, it has a pole. So if you, It has a pole there, and it's a pole of degree 2, and it has no other pole. And it has no zero. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, it has zero. Sorry, sorry. It's got zero. So it's a well defined normomorphic function. Now let me take omega of z equal dz. Remark that it's the same as dz plus 1 of z plus tau. So dz is also a well-defined neuromorphic form. On the torus. And it has no pole and no zero. It has no pole basically because here the coefficient in front is 1. And 1 never vanishes. So it's called a, so it's in fact it's a, it's a holomorphic. <coughs> holomorphic means that it has no pole. So on the torus, it's possible to find uh, one form that has uh, no pole. On the sphere, remember that on the sphere, my form dz has a double pole. In fact, on the sphere, it's not possible to find a holomorphic form uh, without poles. We'll see that in a moment. some names. So 
so classification. According to the definition of forms, are they tensors or just symbols? Uh, <coughs> well, they are tensors. <laughs> Mm. Uh, they are also symbols. <laughs> uh, but uh, you said that uh, you shouldn't think about the external product. Well, a one, a one form is really one form. Mm. It's, it's like a quadratic form is not uh, an order two form. Okay. Okay. It's a power, it's the second power of uh, Order one form. It's not a product. Or it's not a wedge product of one forms. Mm. But it's a quadratic form. I mean, you always use uh, <coughs> functions to define forms, and you work locally in a chart. Mm. But only the so. But if the function in a chart transforms with the power one of a Jacobian, then you say it's a one form. Yeah, but that's also the definition of transforms. Okay, but the definition of dz. I mean, the, the the meaning of the symbol dz for you. Z is Z is was in the, the coordinate in the chart that I used to define my object. Yeah. Z is the coordinate of C. Mm. So it's the coordinate of that parallelogram. Yeah, and the symbol DZ is just a pointer. I mean, it, it tells you just look yeah. at the function. Okay. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it's it's a well-defined object. You can integrate it on arcs. You can compute residues. You can do a lot of things. So I will come back to that in a moment when I do the case of algebraic curves. So, but just let me define uh, so define a definition. A one form is so exact if there exists. F such that omega equals uh, one form omega is if omega equals df. So it's if it is the differential of a function. It's called first kind if it has no pole. It's called third kind. Well it's strange because historically uh, people started by third before second, but uh, okay. <laughs> the good order should be first, third, and second. Uh, if it has at most simple poles. And it's called second kind if uh, basically it's the rest. So it means that there are poles of, or of degree So if there is at least one pole of degree at least two, you call that second kind. So basically, second kind is everything else. No, sorry. Uh, ec there can be second kind exact forms. So, uh, so this one is a little bit apart. I mean, exact forms <coughs> can be first. Uh, no, they cannot be. Well, exact forms can be second kind, for instance. No poles means no zeros. Uh, no, you can have uh, you can have no poles on zeros. It's possible to have zeros if you have no poles. In a function with no pole on no zeros, uh, is a constant. What about holomorphic? Uh, okay, uh, we are talking about one forms. Yes. So there exist one forms that have no poles, but uh, that have zeros, and we will come back to uh, that in a moment. So. Can you give an example of non-exact uh, one-form? Sorry? Can you give an example of non-exact one-form? Uh, a non-exact one-form? Uh, yes, for instance, on the sphere, uh, well, basically, the dz over z on the sphere. So it's d of log z. 
but log z is not a homeomorphic function. Okay, okay. Basically, as soon as there are simple poles with residues, uh, it cannot be an exact form. So in fact, there is a theorem, a one form is exact if and only if for every closed gamma you have integral over gamma of omega equals zero. Uh, it's because uh, if you have your Riemann surface, take a base point O and so imagine there are and there are also poles uh, of omega, okay? And you would like to define f of p uh, would be the integral from O to p of omega. This is in general not well defined because there are several paths from O to p. There can be many paths from O to p, but if this condition is fulfilled, every path would be give the same result. So the function would be well defined <laughs> And it will satisfy, of course, the f equals omega. So, uh, so if all control integrals vanish, then the function is well defined, and it's the primitive of omega, so its differential is omega. Uh, so, there is another theorem which is useful: uh, a function. or uh, one form have a finite number so a function uh, uh, non-identically zero have a finite number of zeros on poles on a compact on a compact Riemann surface and it's because of compacity if you would have an infinite number of poles or let's say an infinite number of zero, zeros imagine that there is an infinite number of zeros uh, by compacity there is at least one subsequence that has a limit uh, among all those zeros, so imagine you have your manifold and you have an infinite number of points where the function vanishes, there must be at least one accumulation point and where there are infinitely many zeros in the vicinity of that point. So which means that in that chart, uh, in the chart that contains that accumulation point, there will be a meromorphic function with an infinite number of zeros in the vicinity of, of this point, and it's clearly not possible. I mean, if the function would have to be identically zero if it's, if it's analytic. An analytic function can uh, have locally only a finite number of zeros. So the total number of zeros on poles must be finite. It's wrong if the surface is not compact. So, uh, and if you take the inverse of a function, then you do the same for zeros and uh, sorry, for poles. And same thing for forms. So uh, another important theorem is that sum of our poles P equals pole of residue at P of omega must vanish. If omega is a meromorphic form, the sum of all its residues must be zeros, must be zero. And for that, assume, well, let us assume for the moment, it's not obvious, that you can cut your surface into polygons. Okay? Uh, and such that there are poles. Okay, some polygons may contain <coughs> poles, other polygons don't contain poles. But so the sum of residue is the sum of all those small integrals which you deform. Uh, and here, well, here you have no pole. Well, basically, the sum of residues is the sum of our such integrals. And 
and so on. And you see that each edge, you go along each edge twice, one in one direction, one in the other direction. So the sum of, uh, so basically the proof is that the sum, sum of our polygons of integral of our, uh, so, uh, of omega, so, so this is equal 1 over 2 pi i, so which is the same as 1 over 2 pi i, the sum of our edges uh, like that, omega, plus the sum of our edges, the same edge like that, so which is 0. So whether there are poles or not. So the sum of all residues must be zero. Uh, does it hold only for exact uh, one forms? Sorry? Does it hold only for exact one forms? Of course. Oh. But exact one forms can have no residue. I mean, for exact one forms, all residues must be zero. So it's stronger. Because if, uh, if you have a residue, then the primitive has a log. So it's not normal so the form is not exact. If there is a residue, this cannot be an exact form. Because when you integrate, you have a log. Uh, it is uh, uh, important that the surface is compact. Uh, yes, we are talking about compact surfaces. Ah, OK, always. So an important theorem also is that, so a theorem is that if f is a meromorphic function, and f is not equal to the zero function, uh, then <coughs> number of zeros would number of poles. And the proof uh, take omega equals the logarithmic derivative of 1 over f df, sum of residue, equals uh, number of uh, zeros minus number of poles. has to be zero. Well, basically, you just apply the previous theorem to the logarithmic derivative of f. And uh, it's understood that they are counted with multiplicities. Yes, yes, counted with multiplicities. Mm -hmm. but sorry, if you just, in the previous theorem, you just take something like uh, dz over z, and you don't consider infinity as a pole or zero, so. No, you, you, you do. You do, but so if you apply the <coughs> theorem on the Riemann sphere, dz over z, so if you take sum of, so where does it have poles? It clearly has a pole at z equals zero. And now in the, in the other chart, you use the coordinate one over z, then you realize that it is minus dz prime over z prime. So it has a pole at z prime equals zero, which is, uh, which is the same as z equals infinity. So this form has two poles. It has two poles on the Riemann sphere. <coughs> it has one pole of degree one at zero, one pole of degree one so on the Riemann sphere. It has one pole of degree one here with residue plus one, and it has one pole there with residue minus one. So the sum of residues is zero. But here we are talking about the number of zeros and the number of poles of functions, not yet of differential forms. Uh, sorry, Bertrand, I, I do not understand why, why did you write f equals zero? Not equal. Non -zero. Ah, so no, okay. sorry, non-zero. Sorry, non-zero. 
Sorry, sorry, she's sorry. No, no, it's not I said no, no, I don't think it's, it's zero, it's but true. I wrote equal to zero. It's still true for zero, right? No, it's not true for zero because the number of zeros is uh, infinite and the yes. number of okay. poles is zero. Okay, come on. <laughs> and it will be important, in fact, in the next theorem. <laughs> so, theorem uh, if f is holomorphic. So no pole implies that F is constant. So the only holomorphic functions are constant. On the proof, choose uh, O belongs to sigma, so it's a reference point, and define, uh, take the function g of p equals f of p minus f of o. Okay. If it's not identically zero, then it has, so if g is not identically zero, so let me put uh, a third part to say identically <coughs> zero, then uh, number of poles of g should be equal to number of zeros of g. Uh, but since we assume that f has no pole, this must be zero. And by definition, g has at least one zero. And this is larger than one. So there is a contradiction, meaning that uh, the only possibility was that g was identically zero. So which implies, so this is impossible. Which implies that G must be at identically zero. So which means that F of P equals F of O. Which implies that F equals constant. So you always assume that the uh, surface is compact. Yes, I'm only talking about compact linear surface because it's the case of algebraic. So, uh, so every holomorphic function is constant, So, it, which means that it's not very interesting to study holomorphic functions. It's more interesting to study meromorphic functions. Oh, so even not on the sphere, even on the arbitrary genus? Yes, constant. on arbitrary genus, a uh, uh, holomorphic function is constant. Again, this is true only uh, if it's compact. So these are general theorems. But now there is one important question is do uh, neuromorphic functions exist at all? <laughs> no. Uh, well, OK, le let me just say. Uh, well, there is another theorem that I will not prove now, which is basically called the Riemann Hurwitz. Which says that for one form, omega, uh, we have that number of zeros minus number of poles equals uh, 2 g minus 2. OK, I'm not going to show it now, <coughs> just for you to know. So for a function, number of zeros minus number of poles equals 0. And for one form, it's equal to 2g minus 2. So uh, let me now uh, go to the second part, which is do. Uh, so it's third existence. Neuromorphic functions on one form. Do they exist at all? <coughs> um, you said that holomorphic functions are constant, constants yeah. in the compact Riemann surfaces. Last time we constructed the compact uh, compact Riemann surfaces at different points. Like yeah. we took the uh, yeah. uh, 
Richmond Square line. So uh, if there was an holomorphic function there, then it's uh, I have a force to be constant. So if you start with a non-compact, then, then you then you and you take an holomorphic function there, and you compactify the Riemann surface, then you force the function to be constant. Right, as a pole. Uh, no, no, yes, uh, usually you can have a pole at the point <coughs> where you compactify. But you have to compactify, but usually you have a pole there. I mean, if your function was not constant and you add a new point, then typically this point at this point you have a pole. Okay. We, we shall see that in a moment with the Newton's polygon method. So, uh, well, in fact, it's not obvious. It's not at all an obvious question. And, uh, you see, everything that I was doing so far used only uh, the complex structure of the Riemann surface, analytic functions and all that. And I don't <coughs> make easy proof of existence that use only analytic functions. Usually you have to go to real C infinity functions and things like that. Uh, it's kind of strange, but uh, you have to use that, so you have to use analysis uh, to prove that. And it's basically going to be based on the Dirichlet uh, principle the green function, things like that. So, but first, uh, so take the example of an algebraic surface. So, we have sigma, that is the desingularization of an algebraic surface, which is the set of x, y, such that p of x, y equals zero. p equals polynomial. So we, we remember we have, uh, so, um, so this map is, uh, let me call that x of p, y of p. And it's the desingularization of, of sigma t. Uh, well, there is obviously, so there exist meromorphic functions. that case, which is typically the function, well, this is an example of a meromorphic function. Well, another example is uh, the function that associates y of p. It's also a meromorphic function. Another example is uh, the function that associates uh, x of p to the square uh, plus x of p y of p. Well, basically, if you take any algebraic combination of, uh, sorry, a, any rational, so we are in general, any uh, thing like a rational function of x of p and y of p will give you a meromorphic function. So, on the case for, so for the case of, uh, algebra of algebraic curves, meromorphic functions do exist uh, because you have your explicit embedding into C cross C. Well, C bar plus C bar. You have your explicit embedding, so, uh, or immersion. You have your explicit immersion, and it gives you uh, automatically some uh, functions, some meromorphic functions. But for instance, it does not answer, does there exist a meromorphic function of a, uh, with a pole at a certain point with a certain degree and all that? It's, it's, it's harder. You, you can do it, but um, we, we shall do it in the next hour. I told you last time that every uh, compact Riemann surface can be represented from an algebraic equation, uh, but I did not prove that theorem, and so let's not assume it, and let's prove the existence of meromorphic functions on meromorphic one forms. Uh, yes, just, just let me tell you also that there exists meromorphic one form. Take, for instance, dx of p. It's an example of meromorphic one form. Yeah. So let's not assume that we have an algebraic curve. So for for the moment. So uh, so let's not assume that we have an algebraic form. And so uh, <coughs> and so we, we shall now uh, prove the existence of meromorphic forms on the on the Riemann surface. 
And uh, just for that, I will need a definition which is of of star. So if you have a differential form, that locally on a chart, so, uh, so now it's not analytical, so let me call it uh, new. So, uh, so now, now I'm not, so I'm using with uh, that my open sets are included in R square, uh, which I identify with C, but I'm not using the analytic structure of C, I'm just using the structure of R square, and so which means that a point Z, so this is R square, uh, I will write my point Z on the form Xi plus I theta. And a differential form is usually written as P, which is a function of Xi and theta. Uh, psi plus Q of Xi on theta, theta. Uh, real, so it's not necessarily real. So P and Q can take real values or complex values. just differentiable functions. Okay. And the definition is that star mu, which be minus q du psi plus p d eta. So this is the definition. Uh, and just remark one thing is that new wedge star mu is uh, on star mu and take the complex conjugate of mu, so it means that just take the complex conjugate of p and q. Uh, it's equal <coughs> to modulus of p to a square plus modulus of q to a square times g psi what g eta. So it's a positive So now if you take uh, <coughs> sorry, instead of R2 uh, <coughs> yes, now sorry, let me take uh, And, uh, and you have that in each chart, so you can in fact, sorry, you can really, you can in fact do that. Uh, yes, okay. So it will be, so you will have this right in each chart, meaning that it's a way you can, uh, you can define, well-defined objects. So let me define L2 of sigma, which is the set of uh, square integral ball. So it's the set of nu such that uh, integral over sigma, so it's a two dimensional integral of nu star wedge nu, wedge nu bar, uh, is, is, uh, is, is finite. So a one form is closed co closed if or only if d mu equals zero d of star mu equals zero. 
Alors, on dit the harmonic if random if d new equals zero equals d of star new. So, what a uh, harmonic form is a form that is at the same time closed and co closed and is exact if and only if there is f such that new equals df or and is co-exact if and only if there is f such that star new equals df or new equals star df star is an evolution So as I said, we need to go through the real structure of the theorem of existence. Okay, we okay. We we'll take a break now. Uh, okay, I just want to finish just the definition. Uh, just the definition. There is uh, sorry. Yes, um, just the definition which is that the Laplacian of a function is d uh, of star d of f. Uh, yes, and uh, there is the Weiss lemma which says that L2 of sigma can be decomposed on harmonic forms. plus exact forms and the adherence of the, the completion of exact forms and co-exact forms. So which means that if you take a new, you can always write it as H. Uh, so Sorry, you can always write it as uh, yes, H, which is harmonic, plus uh, limit when n goes to infinity of d of fn plus limit of when n goes to infinity of star d of vn. Something like that. Or fn, fn equals c infinity uh, function. <coughs> and gn also equals c infinity. So let's take a break then. Okay. In fact, I mentioned this vibes lemma, but we are not going to use it. It's just it's beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful, but we are not going to use it. What we are going to use is the fact that that L2 is a Hilbert space, so it's uh, it's complete. So it means that every sequence has an adherence value. Uh, all right, so uh, so let's forget about this Valls lemma. Um, we are not also going to use the, the, la the Laplacian. Uh, so now, uh, theorem. So take the genus larger than one on the basis of cycles of 2G 2G uh, cycles on sigma so take your Riemann surface and just take any set of 2G cycles that we shall call uh, A1 A2 A G. So A1, so they are oriented arcs, closed arcs, A2, A3, A4. So it's always possible to find such cycles just topologically. It's the theorem of classification of surfaces, of orientable surfaces, which says that uh, you can always do that. Then the theorem is that 
uh, for every epsilon uh, for every epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon two g in R to the two g, there exists a one form new a real one form. Uh, sorry, harmonic one form. Mu such that uh, integral over AI of mu equals epsilon i, and it's unique. So it. And just a remark before proving the theorem, just a remark if you now if you take omega equals mu plus i times star mu, it's a meromorphic, uh, it's a holomorphic form. On sigma, and you have that real part of integral of a i of omega equals epsilon i. So it means that there exists, so this theorem will imply the existence of holomorphic one forms on sigma. As I said on the sphere, there is no such thing, and it's because on the sphere you cannot find AI cycles. Uh, all cycles on the sphere are, are contractible, so this, does, this will not be true for the sphere. Uh, so the theorem, so the corollary, uh, corollary is that there exists holomorphic one form. So, so if nu is harmonic, then uh, star nu is also harmonic, and their sum is clearly holomorphic. I, mean, uh, I, I let you. I mean, uh, the definition of star nu ensures that it satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann uh, uh, relations. So the proof, so choose, uh, so epsilon 1, epsilon 2g equals 1, 0, 0. Okay. And if you are able to put it in that case, uh, the other cases will follow by uh, symmetry and linear combinations. Uh, so you have your Riemann surface. And uh, take A1 and so, sorry, you should do it there. Choose a cycle B that intersects A1, so let's call B. B that intersects. A1, but no other, but not, not AJ with J larger than 1. So it does not intersect the others. It's always possible. And let me now represent only those two things. So my A1, uh, sorry, my B, on my A1 it goes in that direction and let's say B goes in the other direction uh, let's make it in that direction B ok and let's not care about the other things <coughs> choose a, choose Tubular 
neighborhood of B. So we shall choose a tubular neighborhood of B. We shall then, inside this tubular neighborhood, uh, we have a left side of B and the right side of B. And let's choose an even smaller tubular neighborhood on the left side. Okay. And choose. So we have. So the, let's call the red neighborhood, let me call it U. The green neighborhood, let me call it. Uh, v, okay, and the U will be uh, the union of U left U right union B, okay. So U left is the left side of B without B. U right is the right side of B without B. Okay, and V is uh, V is included into B right, U right. Uh, no, sorry, I should have put it. So let me put things in the other direction so that B goes that way. Uh, and so it will be including to you left. Uh, no, it was no, it was the other way around. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <coughs> I want it in your right. So now uh, choose. So. So choose U, uh, choose uh, V, U left, and choose a function theta that belongs to C infinity of sigma minus the B cycle R uh, such that u equals 0 outside of u. Sorry, theta equals 0. Theta equals 1 on v. Theta equals 0 on u left. So it's always possible to do that because there exists an analytic function that's 0 on 1 uh, let's see. Well, you can always choose an analytic function which is like that. You can use the function e to the minus 1 over x, something like that. Uh, well, you, you can use functions like that. So basically, you can use 0 there. Here, you can use e to the minus 1 over x. Uh, plus uh, 1 minus e to the 1 over x minus 1 and here you can use 1. Okay. It's always possible to do that and it's always possible to find such a function theta. Okay. So basically theta takes the value 1 in here and the value 0 there. But theta is discontinuous on along the B cycle. Theta is discontinuous along B, of course, by definition. But D theta is C infinity on sigma. And in particular, it belongs 
uh, it belongs to L2 of sigma. And it is such that, by definition, integral of the A1 of d theta equals 1, because it's the difference of the two values, theta uh, of theta on each side, it's the difference of theta there minus theta there, so it's 1 minus 0. So basically it's theta on the left, sorry, on the right, minus theta on the left, which is 1 on which is 0. Uh, so now we are going to, and, um, of course, and also by definition, Lj of d theta equals 0 for every j larger than 1. So it's a, it's a good starting point. It's a, for, it's a one form that is c infinity, and that has the correct the integrals we want. So now we are going to consider the space of uh, one forms. So now take d theta plus df uh, with now f equals c infinity. From sigma to r. So basically, it's the set of one for it's, it's d theta plus any exact one form. So if you take new any uh, any let me call that not omega but new belongs to that means uh, means that integral of a i of new equals delta i one. <coughs> is there a form in this space uh, that is closed? Or is there a new in this space which is harmonic? So now uh, take, uh, define, uh, there exists a unique new belonging to that space. So let, let me call that space, uh, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. such that. Uh, well, sorry, with minimum, uh, with minimal norm. Sorry. So, u square equals uh, 1 with So how is this possible? Why does it exist? It exists uh, because if you take a sequence, so first, mu square is bounded from below. If you take a sequence of forms that approach the inf, uh, since you have a complete space, since L2 of sigma is a Hilbert space, it's complete, there exists a limit. So there exists a limit. It's easy to see that the limit is unique, but in fact, we don't really need that the limit is unique, but it's easy to see that it's unique. But let's just say that it exists. Uh, so now, uh, if you write that any uh, mu plus df square is larger than mu square, so this implies, if you write what it means, it implies that uh, f, so uh, if it implies, if you write things, that uh, integral over sigma of um, df wedge tau nu uh, must be positive. And since you can use f or minus f, this implies on, on, on the integral of some of minus df positive. So the two imply that integral of df, which term 
must be zero. Um, if you integrate by parts, it implies that uh, f times uh, d of uh, star mu So and since it holds for every f, it implies that d of star mu equals 0. So it implies that mu is co-closed. And mu is obviously closed because uh, every element of e, in fact, are closed. So the idea is that, in fact, in any affine subspace of L2, the element with minimal norm will always be harmonic. And the last uh, <coughs> integral, it is just one integral. Sorry? N it's not a double integral. The last uh, double integral should no be... No, yeah, it's a two form. Yeah. Ah, wedge, sorry. It's sorry. Sorry. Uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, <coughs> no. F no, uh, D of star nu is a two yeah. form. D of it's star nu is a two form. No, it's yeah. correct. It's mm. correct. D of star nu is a two form. <coughs> so the idea is that in the L2, in L2, which is a Hilbert space, every uh, so the minimal so there exists uh, an element, so in every affine subspace of L2, there exists an element with minimal norm, and it has to be harmonic. Mm. And so it means that there, so we have proved the theorem, there exists a harmonic form. So, but so we prove the existence of harmonic forms, and, and then of holomorphic forms in genus larger than one. What happens in genus zero? In genus zero, there is no holomorphic form. Uh, and that's easy to prove, by the way. Uh, in genus 0, if g equals 0, there does not exist holomorphic form. Uh, indeed, if there would exist, uh, so, I, uh, proof, if there exists omega uh, holom without poles, Then, if you define f of p equals integral from O to p of omega, uh, it's well defined because you are in genus zero, so which means uh, uh, which means it's simply connected. So basically, the result is independent of the choice of path from O to p because there is only one path from O to p, homotopically. Uh, so it's uh, it would be a holomorphic function. So which implies that f must be a constant, which implies that omega equals df equals 0. <coughs> well, except uh, of course the 0 is always uh, has no point. So in genus zero, there's no homomorphic one form. Then uh, the exist, but what I'm going to say is that in any, uh, so now uh, the theorem is that uh, now for any genus, uh, and P1, P2 uh, points, distinct points of sigma, there exists a one form omega such that omega has simple poles at P1 and P2 and a residue of omega at P1 equals plus 1 equals minus residue at P2 of omega. And no other pole. Okay. 
Okay. The way you do it is very similar to what I just did. But there are some subtleties because of the poles. So our forms, so forms that have poles are usually not square integrables. So you have to be careful. It means you have to define a kind of regularized norm. But in fact, you see that in the end of the proof, all that I have to compute is the difference of two norms. So, it's, uh, so it goes well. Uh, it's written in the, the proof is written in the notes, but the idea is the following. So now take P1 on P2. Take, choose a path from P1 on P2. There can be, uh, there can be something else here. Take a neighborhood. Take a neighborhood. And it's as before, you sa shall separate your neighborhoods into several parts. Here, you want a function that, has, that takes the well value 1. Here, you want a function that takes the value 0. And here, in that neighborhood, you want it to take the value, uh, well, here in that neighborhood, you want to take basically the argument of z minus p1. one over two pi. And here also you want to take minus one over two pi argument of z minus phi of pi two. So which I remind you is uh, one over two pi imaginary part of log of z minus phi of phi one. So basically you want your, you, you shall define a function theta that behaves like that. Okay, and by definition again, integral of d theta, uh, d theta around on a small contour around p1 uh, will be uh, one over two pi i. Sorry, let me not put that. Sorry, one over two pi equals one, and integral over two pi. P2 of D theta is minus 1, and you shall again consider the space of D theta plus Df, F equals C infinity. And again, you shall look for the element with minimal norm, and, uh, and basically it will give you what you want. I'm not going to do all the details, it's in my notes. But the idea is that you can always find uh, a theta, and, and theta is. 0 everywhere else. And it's infinity. Okay, so that works, and that shows. Now, when you have forms with simple poles, just by taking derivatives with the positions of poles, you can get forms with arbitrary degree poles. And in fact, uh, and in fact for now, if you take P belong to sigma, and K larger than 2, there exists omega that has a pole of degree k at q and no other pole. You just take the derivatives of simple poles. So this proves that you can always find forms Neomorphic forms with poles basically wherever you want, or of whatever degree you want. Now let me go to the case of algebraic. So it's four. So you take an algebraic equation P of x, y equals sum over i, j, P, i, j, x, i, y, j. And I will often use this in the, in the i, j plane. So you have integer points. So uh, what I'm plotting is z, z cross z. And I'm going to plot a point whenever p i j is non zero. So 
So whenever there is a non-zero pij, I got that. Okay. So as I said, uh, so theorem. So uh, for every r that belongs to C of x y, the function which Uh, is so the function uh, f of t is a normal on sigma, and the converse is also true. Every uh, is of that form. And more precisely, since you can use uh, the relationship, let's say that j, the maximum value of j is d, so d is the degree in the y variable, <coughs> uh, there exists uh, q1, q0 of x, q1 of x, q index d minus 1 of x, all of them are rational functions, sorry, rational function of x uh, such that f of p <coughs> equals sum from j equals 0 to d minus 1 of qj of x of p y of p to the j. So you can even write it as a polynomial. <coughs> it's because you Use that p equals zero. And it's in general not uh, the way to write that is not unique. So the proof, I'm not going to do it, it's in the notes, but basically it's to use uh, Lagrange interpolating polynomial. Every meromorphic function is a rational function of x and y, and every meromorphic form is also a sort of theorem. So there exists an R of x, y such that omega of p equals r of x of p y of p times dx of p and well you could say that but let me choose a denominator which is the p prime y of x of p y of p it's more convenient to write it this way and you can you could always reabsorb this in the definition of r because r is a rational function but it's more convenient to write it this <coughs> way because uh, so for short I would just write this as r of x y dx over p prime y of x y and this is called the Poincaré form Poincaré uh, Okay. Now I want to study how. So now I want to study what is there some good choices of R of x y? Is there some good choices of R of x y such, such that I can get something that is holomorphic, so without pose? Or is there a good choice of R of x y such that I can have only simple pose or double pose or and so on? So how can you classify the R of x, y? And first, 
In order to see where the poles are, it's important to know where the poles of the function x of p and y of p are. So, poles uh, of x and p and y of p. So typically, imagine that. Uh, so, let Q a pole of X of order minus alpha and a pole of Y of order minus beta. So it means that locally x in a good chart around q, x would behave as uh, so choose a choose a chart near q uh, with coordinates <coughs> phi of q equals zero. So basically, you choose the disk at uh, center that q. And, uh, and the coordinate we have equal z. So it means that x behaves like uh, c z to the power minus alpha and y will behave like z to the power minus beta. Okay. So the theorem is that the exponents alpha and beta cannot be arbitrary. They are related to your polynomial, and they cannot be arbitrary. Uh, the coefficients alpha and beta must be such that uh, <coughs> there exists a tangent Uh, so, let me give a name. N is the Newton polytop is the set of ij such that p ij is from zero. So basically, it means that, uh, what is it? Minus beta over alpha must be a slope. Convex in the log. So which means that, let me plot the convex envelope here. It's that, 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 that. So in fact, for this example, there can be only four poles of x and y. And one would correspond to, uh, uh, so le let's focus, for instance, on that one. This one uh, so this one would correspond to alpha equals uh, one and beta equals two. So this one would correspond to alpha equals one. Beta equals two. So how do we prove that? Why not two and four? Uh, if uh, so, if y somehow is a power of x, it means that somehow you have not used the you have not used the a good local oh, variable. Okay. Well, so. Yes, so the, the, common, the, the common denominator of alpha and beta, I mean, they should be relatively prime. Otherwise, it means that you do not choose a... No, okay. No, so sorry, sorry. It is possible, but somehow it could happen only if you have this. Then you could have two and four. Okay. Uh, uh, let me consider the <coughs> situation. So, uh... So, 
So uh, <coughs> yes, how do we prove that? So first, consider the, the line of equation. So proof. So, sorry, what, what is m? What is uh, sorry? Right plus pj equal to m? Non-zero coefficient. What? Well, and uh, so it just means that there is a, a line parallel to the line alpha i plus beta j equals zero. So there, there exists m. Uh, so there exists some m such that we have that. Proof. So define, let d alpha beta m is the uh, line of equations alpha i plus beta j plus m equals zero. So on my polynomial, you take any alpha, any beta, and any m, and you have a line like that, d alpha beta m. Not necessary. Okay, I should not choose it necessary. So let's choose it this way. So is it the slope alpha minus alpha over beta? Yes, right. maybe it's minus alpha over beta. Yeah. Then your example makes sense because it's yeah, minus one half. Yes, so take the line d alpha beta m. And let's choose, let's move m such that it starts touching the Newton's polygon. So let m equals, so let's define m alpha beta equals uh, n is left of uh, that left side of m of, uh, of d alpha beta m. So basically, you approach your line until it touches the polygon. Then it means that the line d alpha beta and m alpha beta touches is non is non empty. So it means you touch the polygon at at least one point. Imagine that you touch the polygon at only one point. So if that would imply that if you take p of x y equals sum of i j p i j, uh, so it means that sorry. Imagine this is the point IJ, and there is no other point. Then, uh, if you look at all the terms here, it will behave when z goes to zero, like uh, PIJ. So only that term, uh, c to the i, c tilde to the j, times z to the minus alpha i minus beta j okay so which is uh, so and which is non zero because by definition this is non zero and by definition this is non zero and by definition this is non zero so which is non zero so which is a contradiction because this is zero. So basically, in all the terms here in that sum, I choose the highest power of z. And the highest power of z is a unique term, because I assume <coughs> that my returns, that there is a unique term with maximal value of alpha i. Uh, so, so basically, here I choose the maximal alpha i plus beta j, and by definition, the uh, maximum value of alpha i plus beta j, by definition, is my m alpha beta. So, sorry, 
answer is it should be m positive or it's arbitrary? Arbitrary. But, but what is the, the meaning? You can always find uh, for any alpha well, beta? OK, it's because I don't want to enter the details, but there can be situations where you have a pole of x on the 0 of y, or a pole of y on the 0 of x. So I mean, some of the orders alpha and beta can be positive or negative. But uh, do you consider this axis also parts of the polygon? No? Sorry? Do you consider x axis and uh, I yes, I yes, axis? Yes, 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 I consider the axis parts of the polygon for, for the moment. OK, uh, let me do the theorem only in the case where both alpha and beta are positive. OK, there can be other cases, but let me just discuss the situation where both alpha and beta are positive. You, you, mean you don't want the case where this line is inside the polygon or crossing? Or well, it seems that you always can find this uh, line regardless of what are... Yeah, yes, I'm saying yeah, you can find this line. But what I'm proving is that this line must touch the polygon <coughs> in, ta in at least two points. Mm. So it's tangent. Mm. So which is a contradiction. So which means that this hypothesis was impossible. So which means it's wrong. So which implies that cardinal of D alpha beta M alpha beta inter N must be larger than 2. Which implies that D alpha beta M alpha beta is tangent to the convex envelope of N. So which means what I plotted here, the red line is in fact not possible. So if you touch in only one point, this is incompatible with P of x, y equals 0. <coughs> you must touch in at least two points. And so it means that this was not possible. The only possibility is that your d alpha beta n is like that. And you touch in two points, one, two. You could also touch in three points, or four points, and so on. And in fact, there is, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between poles of x and y and slopes of, of the convex envelope and tangents to the convex envelope. So every pole okay. Sorry. So now, uh, now let me study uh, this set of forms. So now let me define omega k L equals x k y sorry x k minus one L So let's <coughs> study that form. <coughs> so the theorem is that omega k L equals first kind no pole if and only if the point k L belongs to the interior of the Newton's polygon. What do I call the interior of so, uh, so the interior points to the Newton's polygon will be the integer points strictly inside and also not on the boundary. So here in that case I have five of them. So, and so, and in fact, this implies that uh, well, I'm finished very soon. This implies that the dimension of first order, first kind forms equals the cardinal of. And, on, and we'll see later that it is the genus. OK. Uh, generic case. 
which means no non-point. <coughs> In fact, the true statement is that this will be minus number of nodal points. And this is the genus. OK. So it means you have a way to create neuromorphic forms of first kind, second kind, third kind, just by writing that. And just knowing where the point KL is in the plane, you know if you have, uh, uh, you know how many poles you have, and what degree they have, and, so, and all that. And in fact, here, if it belongs to the boundary of a convex envelope for a third kind form, it means. Uh, that it is one of those points. And each such point is at the intersection of exactly two tangents. <coughs> so every such point is at the intersection of two tangents. Uh, and I told you that each tangent corresponds to a certain pole of x and y. So each tangent corresponds to a certain pole. Uh, and let's label them. Let's label them q1 will be the pole corresponding to that slope. Q2 will be the pole corresponding to that slope. Q3 will be a pole corresponding to that slope. And Q4 will be a pole corresponding to that slope. OK? So if you have, if your point KL is there, then you will get a third kind form uh, that has a simple pole at Q2 and at Q3. So. If so, uh, so if KL is the intersection of uh, QI, QI plus one, then omega KL has simple poles at QI and QI plus one, and no other pole. Um, but the residue is more, um, there is no simple expression for the residue you will have to compute. What about the axis? The point on the axis? Uh, they are considered like, uh, they, uh, as you see here, I, I assume k on L larger than 1. Okay. Let me take k on L larger than 1. Otherwise, there would be a pole when x equals 0. Okay, it's related to the previously asked question. You could also work I mean, on projective curve. You could also look at zeros of x and y. Okay. Uh, let me just do the points. And if you are outside, if you are outside, it means that you are, where, do you, where are you? If you are outside, for instance, if you are at, uh, let me take a good example. Let me take that point. You see that point is outside of that curve. It's outside of that curve, but it's not outside of that curve or not outside of that curve. So here, this point will correspond to a pole uh, at Q4 and at Q3, but not at Q2 or Q1. So if, so if, KL uh, is outside of QI, then it implies omega KL has a pole at QI. And in fact, uh, 
the degree of the pole is the is one plus the distance to that line to, to a vertical distance. So in that case, this k value of k l would mean that uh, you have a degree two pole at q three. So if you choose that point, you have a degree two pole at q three. No, sorry, no. because I no. because I did not, no, not because my line <laughs> is not straight. <laughs> sorry, my line has uh, slope. Uh, so sorry. So let's take another one. Let's take this one. It has a degree two pole at Q three, not Q two. Sorry. Well, that was right. Isn't it vertical yeah. distance. Yes, vertical distance. And it has a degree two pole at Q two and a degree three pole at Q three. Okay. Where's the vertical distance three? You go uh, you so Q three was that line. Sorry. Oh Q three <laughs> minus line. one. That was Q three. So it's two then. Now sorry, it's two plus I said it's one plus that. Ah it's one plus. So degree so one plus distance to the line uh, Okay, uh, let me finish now. So this theorem is not hard to prove. You just replace here uh, x by z to minus alpha, y to uh, y by z to minus beta, and you just compute what is the largest term, and you just find that. So it's very easy. Uh, it's fairly easy, and so it's just a very simple computation. Okay. Uh, well, just one small remark. Uh, dx can have zeros, but the zeros of dx are precisely zeros of p prime y. So which means that the form has no pole at the zeros of dx, or it has no pole at the zeros of the denominator. If you want all the zeros of the, the denominator, are killed by zeros of dx. Uh, you can see that in using a local chart near the branch plot. OK. I won't go into more details of proving the theorem, but it's very easy, but it's just combinatorial. For every kl, you know where you are, and you know precisely what kind of pose you have. And if you want to find the basis of holomorphic forms, you just look at all the interior points and for generic, so if there is no nodal point, I can tell you immediately that this curve has genus 5. Because there are 5 interior points. So this curve has obviously genus 5 because it has 5 interior points. It could have le uh, smaller genus if there is nodal points, but you can think that a nodal point is like a cycle that you have contracted. So that's why the genus is actually uh, the number of interior points minus the number of nodal points. Okay. Uh, so, so generically, when there is no nodal point, the genus is just the interior, the number of interior points. So, thanks for your attention. Just let me mention that next time I will talk about the Abel map and the Jacobian, and basically show that all those monomorphic functions and forms and all that can be written in terms of theta functions. And we talk about basically theta functions. by email, otherwise I'm here, uh, I work here, so I'm here more or less all the time. <coughs> um, I don't know if you stay for lunch or